Hey everyone, just a warning that for this week's episode, we had some technical issues during the Zoom meeting, so some of the attendees' audio got blended into parts of the recording. We removed what we could, but we apologize in advance. lesson this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 to 15 and um, we have two versions that we're going to be reading for you. Voice one, Mr. Clark will read from the New Revised Standard Version and I will bring you the message version. Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 to 15. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom, do you think God sits in a box theater, a box seat? But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like that, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pause with me in prayer. Holy Spirit, words of life. We pray that you would fall afresh on our souls. Amen. So here's an embarrassing story. The first time I visited my future in-laws at their home, we sat down to dinner and they asked me to bless the meal. And I said out loud, I don't really like praying. <laughs> they kind of looked at me like, I thought you were a pastor? <laughs> and I kind of looked back, and they haven't asked me since. <laughs> it's really not my proudest moment. But when I say I don't like praying, what I mean is I don't like feeling pressure to come up with on the spot, to come up with words that are beautiful and convey like a heightened spiritual maturity and fit the context, a prayer that is not too long, but not cursory either, the Goldilocks of length and particularity while still being universal with a deep nod to our Christian tradition of words 
our grandparents use with something also unique and contemporary thrown in. A prayer that makes people smile, see something in a different light, and is done before the food gets cold. I don't like that kind of praying. I mean, I will do it when it is expected of me, but I don't like enjoy it. And from my experience asking people to pray before or after church meetings or church meals, neither do most of you. That doesn't make you a bad Christian. I hope it doesn't make me a bad pastor. Or if you zone out sometimes, or if reading these unison prayers in the bulletin sometimes feels like just reading someone else's words than talking to God, or if you tell yourself that you're going to pray before bed every night, but then you play Wordle instead, or you read another chapter of your book, or you work yourself up to the point where you collapse into bed and forget to pray, safe space here. Prayer can feel like a performance. And it's not, and it shouldn't be. Whenever you pray, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so they may be seen by others. When you are praying, Jesus says, do not heap up empty phrases. Prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not something where you are paid by the word. And yeah, prayer is something that everybody needs to practice, but it's not something you can be bad at. Like you just didn't get that particular talent when the talents were being handed out. It's like breathing. You innately know how to breathe. And there are ways to practice breathing to do it with more awareness, to breathe in a way that empowers your voice or your running or your weightlifting, or to breathe in a way that calms your nervous system. We practice and learn about and make conscious changes to our breathing so that it becomes a more effective tool. But no one is ungifted at breathing. In the same way we practice and learn about and make conscious changes to our praying, but no one is ungifted at praying. Think about plants that turn toward the sunlight, like a, like a sunflower. It's so subtle when it happens, and what makes it turn is not the power of the plant, but the power of the light. Something in the plant knows that it needs that sunlight without the plant even having a conscience. It's not the plant's will that makes it turn toward the light, it's that the light is life-giving and the plant is hardwired to seek out life. Our bodies are hardwired to seek out life too, like when you're really thirsty or if your body really needs salt, it will go for it or if it needs sleep, at some point it will circumvent your will to get what it needs. Our souls, I believe, are hardwired too, to seek life, to turn toward the light, to turn toward God. And so it's not so much our will or our skill as it's the power of the light and the thing deep inside us that knows we need it and compels us to turn ever so slightly and to say, God? And that's what prayer is to me. It's the turning. For the next four weeks, we're gonna be talking about prayer, boiled down to four basic themes following along with Anne Lamott's book, Help, Thanks, Wow. And this week is help week. Prayers asking God for help. Now in one sense, maybe these are the hardest prayers for those of us who don't like asking for help from anyone, who don't like the way it feels like we're giving up, admitting that we can't do it. Those of us who would never consciously, conceivably pray, Jesus take the wheel because we have our hot little hands on the wheel. And we are very good drivers, thank you very much, and do not touch the steering wheel, God.
God. Maybe we don't ask help from God or from anyone else because we would prefer to do it ourselves, our way. Or maybe we're terribly afraid of being an inconvenience. Like we would gladly help every friend, neighbor, family member, or stranger who needed a meal or a ride or a chore done. But we somehow feel that they would see us as a burden if we ask for the same thing. Maybe we're deeply afraid that if we ask for help, it won't come. Terrified that if we ask God for help, it won't come. And where would that leave us? So on the one hand, prayers of help might seem like the hardest reach of our four categories here. But on the other hand, help can be the prayer that comes most automatically, most authentically, when we really need it. Like when our back's against the wall and we are out of options, we finally, finally do that turning toward a power beyond ourselves, that turning toward God and our soul, maybe even without words, just cries or screams or whimpers, help. The Bible is full of that kind of prayer, more than any other, maybe in the Psalms and in the parables and in the stories. The Israelites cry out to God again and again, save us, deliver us, free us, fight for us. Every day it seems of Jesus' ministry as recorded in the gospels, people come to him and say, help me. My daughter is dead. My friend can't walk. I cannot see. My servant is sick. I've been bleeding for weeks. I don't have a friend in the world. Help me. These are not long-winded prayers. They are not proud prayers. And they're not cop-outs either. It's not like, oh, I don't want to do anything about all these problems in my life or these injustices in my community or the suffering of the world, so I'll just pray about it, hand it over to God, and get it off my conscience. Prayers of help are part of doing everything we can and recognizing that there are limits to what we can do. The people who beg Jesus for healing cannot heal themselves and they are desperately seeking connection, desperately and faithfully tapping into something outside of themselves. Hear these words of Jesus himself the ultimate help prayer, if you will, from the day he prayed in Gethsemane before being betrayed by his disciple and then arrested and beaten and executed by the Romans. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 39. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. That is not a cop-out prayer. Jesus has done so much in his short life. He has worked tirelessly to change hearts and lives and systems. And he really has changed the world more than he can possibly know at that moment. But what is about to happen, the betrayal, the humiliation, the agony, the death on a cross at the hands of the empire, he is powerless to stop. He cannot. There is work that is ours to do in the world. And God equips us for it, and we are capable, and we hopefully do it. And then there comes a time Many times, perhaps, when we are up against something far beyond our ability to change or fix 
or control. Yes, we come up against powerful systems of evil that dehumanize and destroy. Right. We come right. up against sickness, debilitating depression, cancer, addiction, unimaginable loss, and the numbing grief that follows. And our prayer, like Jesus, becomes simply help. Jesus, having done so much world-changing work in his lifetime, came up against torture and death, and he prayed, God, please make this stop. Please get me out of here. The same prayer we pray when we're up against what we cannot change, help. Those prayers of help are the turning toward. And in the turning toward, there's also a letting go. Letting go of any charade that we're in charge, that we can change this. And when we say help God, we let go of our grip on thinking that we can fix it. And so we get a little bit free to do what we can do in the tragedy of the moment and to let God be God which is not something we totally or even slightly understand. Like, what are you doing, God? Why didn't you do what Jesus asked for there in Gethsemane? Why don't you do what good and faithful people ask you to do? Why do you let these abhorrent things, these daily painful things, just keep happening? Well, I, Kara, don't have an answer on behalf of God, except to say that even though God didn't change the course of events when Jesus asked him to, I have to believe that God heard and took him seriously, like his prayer wasn't wasted. It wasn't just a going through the motions thing. And I think that God showed up and accompanied the human part of Jesus through, that God went through it too, goes through it with us, shows up every single time. But there is a power beyond our power turning us toward the light. All I know to say is we're not alone. And God doesn't leave us hanging when we ask for help. It really is okay to ask and to let go. And so what are some practices for the prayer of help that you could try this week, the prayer of letting go? Someone I know who listens to people's problems all day long has a bucket of dirt outside her office. And when she leaves work for the day, she puts her hands in the dirt like washes her hands in the dirt and she leaves all that she's taken in that day there, like planted, resting. That's a letting go, that's a prayer. Sometimes I go somewhere where it's safe to do this and I throw rocks. I promise it's safe. <laughs> when there are situations that I simply cannot carry anymore, I can't do anything about them, and I am frankly mad at God for letting them happen, I put them on rocks and I throw them into a field, into a river, wherever. I just away. Maybe you'll pick up a prayer journal from the narthex this week. Will you write down what you're letting go of every day before you fall asleep? You really don't have to say anything profound in any of these help prayers. In fact, you don't need words at all. Words are one vehicle for prayer, but they themselves aren't the prayer. And God doesn't have a preferred vehicle. Like if your prayer doesn't arrive on the Mercedes of eloquent poetry and perfect theology, it goes in God's spam folder. No. You don't need words at all for the inward turning, like the flower, or like when you see a dog's ears perk up. She's suddenly aware and listening in a different way. 
Prayer is like something inside of us perking up, turning in toward the divine. No fancy words, no public performance, no heaping up of empty phrases like Jesus says there in Matthew 5. No, when he needed to pray, Jesus asked his friends to come around him. And he said, help. Honest and humble and truthful. He asked his friends, stay with me, stay around me, hold this space. Let us pray. God, by the bread of heaven and the cup of life, you make us one body. Bind us together by your spirit that we may live into your hopes for us. A community centered in Christ and rich in compassion, commitment, courage, and care. May it be so. Amen. Thank you for showing up today, for showing up with one another, trying something different. And as you go out, go to the picnic. And as you go out from there, know that you know how to pray just like you know how to breathe. Know that God is our home and we are ever turning toward home. So go with great hope in conversation with the one who made you, with the one who saves you and the one who calls you home. Go in peace. Amen.